Hi, I'm Weston Labar with Cargomatic. Very excited today to have John Wolf, CEO of the Northwest Seaport Alliance, join us. John, how are you doing today? Oh, great, Weston. And thanks for inviting me uh, to, to join the Cargomatic team today and address the challenges of uh, and opportunities of our uh, interesting industry. It's good to well, be John. here. You know, as we spoke before, uh, you know, your, your name has become synonymous with the right way to lead a seaport. I told you that I, I've, I've spoken with so many people that really admire not just what you've done and bringing the two ports together and getting common leadership and common goals for the entire region, uh, but also what you're embarking on, which we're going to learn about today, uh, the projects you're working on, the way to make the gateway more competitive and you know, whether it's my time here at Cargomatic or, you know, when we got to know each other, when I was CEO of the Harbor Trucking Association, we've always talked about the West Coast as a gateway and how do you promote all the services from really from San Diego all the way up to, to Seattle, right? And, and make sure that there's uh, differentiating of services, that there's a lot of different offerings, but that the infrastructure, the technology, it's there to service the shipper. And so excited to hear today about not only your thoughts about the industry and where we're going, and I know you've got a presentation that you're going to hop into, but really talking about what you're doing as a seaport, maybe even talk about, you know, the way you work with your colleagues, because I think one of the things that we've seen over the last couple of years is uh, there's been coalition building, whether it's on harbor maintenance tax or other issues that the West Coast ports have come together to say, listen, enough is enough. We're going to, we're not just going to preserve market share. We're going to go back to the market in a strong way and say, bring the cargo here. Yeah, happy to uh, touch on some of those uh, partnership opportunities. As you know, well, Weston, um, this is still a people industry. And at the end of the day, it's about those working relationships. So to your point, uh, the strength of our gateway is built around uh, just that, the relationships we have with our customers and key stakeholders, and certainly the other ports um, on the West Coast and really around the nation. Yeah, so, so John, let's hop right into it. You know, tell us a little bit about your thoughts of what's going on in the in the industry. And if you want to switch to your presentation and walk us through the, your PowerPoint, I'll do something that I'm not always good at. I'll be quiet for a little while and I'll, I'll let you give the people the update because that's that's who they came to see. John Wolf, CEO of the Northwest Seaport Alliance, telling us what's going on at the ports of Seattle and Tacoma and the broader uh, Pacific Northwest. Great. Thank you, Weston. So I'm going to focus in three areas. Um, First of all, I'm going to focus on our cargo volumes and the status of our gateway from an operational standpoint. Um, and I'm going to move to um, the global market conditions. Um, at least from our perspective, um, there, there are obviously very different perspectives out there, and that's important uh, for us to both share our perspectives and hear from us. And then the last uh, area that I'm going to focus on has to do with our key accomplishments from 2022. And uh, a focus on uh, the critical initiatives uh, as we look to uh, 2023 and beyond. So that's the uh, uh, focus. And then I, I really look forward to uh, some time for Q&A because it's always really helpful for me to hear what's top of mind from other experts in the industry. So uh, moving on, just, just quickly before you go, I want to remind everybody, we'll do Q&A at the end. And just please make sure that the questions are germane to what's going on in the PNW, to what's going on in the broader port industry. Um, we're going to focus very much on uh, the ports trade, um, not so much maybe technical questions on Cargomatic or lanes or other things. We can always answer those questions offline. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Weston. Um, first of all, just for those that are maybe uh, less familiar with the Seaport Alliance, the Seaport Alliance was formed in 2015. It's a partnership between the ports of Seattle and Tacoma. And the, and the impetus for forming the alliance was really uh, a focus on uh, the fact that from a global perspective, the industry looks at Seattle, Tacoma, and Puget Sound as a single gateway. And so we should act that way. And um, Good on our commissioners. Uh, they're elected here in, in uh, King County and Pierce County. So it's a little unique uh, uh, structure of our, of our ports here in Washington state. Yet the uh, 10 commissioners uh, of uh, Tacoma and Seattle came together back in 2015 and decided rather than to compete on a small scale here in Puget Sound that we, we uh, play in the major leagues and we wanted to act that way. And so we formed the Seaport Alliance as a joint venture partnership. 
to eliminate any form of competition here locally with Seattle Tacoma, yet really focus our energy and, and, and our competitiveness on how we compete on the uh, global scale. So it's working well. It's not perfect by any means, yet I, I, I will say that um, we're in year eight. And um, like, like any marriage or partnership, uh, you know, there's, there's always things that you can improve on. Um, in my seven years uh, uh, leading this effort, along with many others, um, I, I see only a, a stronger Seaport Alliance today than I did uh, in previous years. And I think that will continue to, to be the case. Uh, moving to the next slide, I wanted to just quickly touch on um, the, uh, the impact we have uh, through our gateway. Um, we are an economic engine for the state of Washington. We create significant amount of job opportunities for the community we serve here in the state of Washington through the partnership with our customers. And uh, so we can't do it alone. And you can see uh, the cargo volumes here and the uh, and the work hours associated with the cargo volumes. This is a snapshot of 2022. And uh, so I won't I won't walk through the details, but you can see um, what um, the activities of our gateway provide as an economic impact to the state of Washington and really beyond that. Next slide, please. Um, it may not be uh, well known to everyone that we um, do have a uh, diversity of our business portfolio. We certainly focus uh, heavily on the uh, container market, both international container market, as well as the domestic market that we serve Alaska and Hawaii through our customer uh, partnerships with Matson and Tote. Um, yet we also have uh, a, a non-containerized break bulk business. And um, one thing to note about the break bulk business is we actually operate that business as a Seaport Alliance. So we have Seaport Alliance uh, staff that are managing the day-to-day -day terminal operations with that break bulk business. And then uh, we also have partners that bring automobiles uh, through our gateway, both import and export. And that's a growing piece of business for us, as you can see as well. Um, the numbers down below, you can see um, the, uh, the dip in year-over-year uh, -year volume on the container side, yet a significant growth in our non-containerized business. And I'll, I'm going to focus most of my presentation on the container business, but I just wanted everyone to be aware we do have a mix of cargo moving through our gateway. Next hey. slide. Hey, John, quickly, first question, because, you know, we talk about the different types of seaports so often, and a lot of times, you know, the West Coast is looked at as only landlord ports, and by and large, that's true. Um, yeah. We talk about, you know, other ports being operating ports, and you're unique because while you're mostly a landlord port, you do have, uh, you know, in Tacoma, you have uh, operations, obviously, that you're overseeing. Do you want to talk a little bit about how that makes you unique, uh, how that maybe makes you understand the trials and tribulations of your terminal operators a little bit better? I mean, just talk about your experience with that, because uh, I do think people forget sometimes that you have a hands-on operation up there. Yeah, thank you for that question, Wesson. Uh, I think it is unique um, in that we're a hybrid model. We we do operate um, to a small degree, both, uh, as I mentioned, with the break bulk business. We also operate two intermodal rail yards for the container business. So we have our hands into the operations. I grew up in operations, so I'm really passionate about operations. I, I worked in the private sector for major steamship lines, and most of that time was in operations. So um, our team, uh, although we 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 operate to a small degree, and then we are also a landlord port like other um, uh, West Coast ports, um, it really is helpful for us to uh, keep our hands into the operations because we more fully understand our customers' needs, and I think we can be better, uh, more more responsive, and and better uh, stewards of our assets by having some level of control of these public assets. Um, quite frankly, I've uh, challenged our team to look for ways where selectively we might step further into operational uh, control because the other aspect that we really carry as a value here at the Seaport Alliance, and I know other ports do too, but it's, it, it's fundamental to um, our value system and that is customer care. And um, the best way that we can serve our customers is to understand their needs and then be responsive and show the business fit. And so 
uh, we spent a lot of time talking about that and working those issues. And it's challenging at times when you are a landlord port and you hand the keys over to a private operator. Um, you give them permission basically to operate the way they see fit. And sometimes it's not the way we would want our gateway to operate. So we are looking uh, for other opportunities where we can uh, you know, dip our toe further into the pool of, of terminal operations. And I'm excited about that opportunity. And if you ever need a trucking partner, uh, please let us know. Obviously, we have the the, the largest digital platform uh, in the nation. And I think what's great about our partnership is if we need assets, we'll go get the assets, but we really can help uh, engage the broader trucking community. And, and one of the things I'm so proud of is how we've been able to help these small mom and pops reduce their administrative burden and, and continue to grow and get access to larger enterprise level customers. And so wherever you're looking to expand operations, if there's a trucking element, I'll just throw my little Cargomatic, uh, you know, pitch to you, but let us know how we can be involved. That's great. Yeah. It, I mean, we, we always, uh, rely on those valued stakeholders as partners. So appreciate that offer and we'll keep that in mind for sure. Uh, so moving to the next slide. Uh, this is a snapshot of uh, the container volumes moving through our gateway over uh, since 2018, last, last five years. Um, and uh, you can see there's been um, some some dips in the in the volumes, annual volumes. Uh, first in 2020, no surprise, that's when uh, the pandemic really started to show itself in a strong fashion here in the states, and we felt the effects of that. Um, and I'm sure you all did as well. And that's reflective of the volumes that we handled in 2020. What was interesting about um, the following year is we were really expecting, and I think many in the industry another really challenging year in 21 due to the ongoing pandemic and concerns about the economy. And, and like many other gateways, what we saw was a huge uh, influx of import cargo coming into the United States. And we experienced that through our gateway and that's reflective in those numbers in 2021, which of course then created significant supply chain uh, congestion problems. And our gateway suffered from that as well. And, and that was really frustrating for us because it goes back to what I talked about, um, our, our uh, desire to be best in class customer care. And, and we were not uh, at a level of service offering where I am comfortable. Uh, and so we, we really challenged ourselves and our, and our customer, I mean, our stakeholders to step up their game. Happy to talk more about some of the things we did there later in my presentation. Um, we, we also then, uh, of course, in 2022, you see the dip again. Um, that, that is as a result of a couple of things. Um, first of all, uh, the West Coast uh, PMA labor contract, of course, is still yet to be resolved. I'm optimistic that it will be resolved here um, maybe in the next couple of months. I, I'm hearing that they're making progress uh, at the table there, and I'm encouraged by the fact that they've remained at the table even through some difficult negotiations. That has affected um, our cargo volumes and shifted cargo to the Gulf and East Coast, which I think uh, you're all aware of. Uh, the other aspect, though, that's important that may, maybe is less visible. Um, we have been negatively impact, impacted by uh, the blank sailings, the number of blank sailings at our gateway. And part of that is as a result of the service offerings, the international service offerings that call our gateway. Oftentimes, those services, weekly services, also call a Canadian port like Vancouver or Prince Rupert. And the Canadian ports have experienced significant congestion, especially on the rail side. And what's happened with some of our uh, service offerings is they will say they'll call a Vancouver port and they get delayed there because of the congestion problems. And to get back on schedule, the, uh, the shipping line may skip the Seattle Tacoma call um, so they can get back to Asia, get back on schedule. That's been really frustrating for us in an area where we've really doubled down our focus in working with the ocean carriers to see if we can attract more first port of call offerings here in Seattle, Tacoma. So, um, so those are the two main factors that have caused the reduction in volume in 2022. 2023, I expect we'll have an uptick uh, over the 22 volumes. Uh, part of, you know, I, I'm, I'm, going to be optimistic here that we're not going to fall into a deep recession. I think there's signs uh, from 
uh, you know, economic signs that that maybe it's going to be a softer landing and that we we could bounce back uh, second half of this year. And I would expect um, with that assumption that our volumes um, should show up um, closer to that 3.7, 3.8 million TUs in 2023 is my best estimate at this time. You know, John, I couldn't agree with you more about the economy. I'm 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 very bullish on where we're going to go. Obviously, when you have extreme high highs, and uh, let's just be honest, a lot of importers did not want to have some of the same follies of 2021 plague them in 2022. Essentially, the message was get the cargo here, make sure that we can service our customers, and if we have too much, we'll figure it out later. But make sure that we have uh, product available when people are shopping online or coming into stores. And so because of that, we've obviously seen a bit of a dip, but consumer spending has stayed extremely high. I couldn't agree with you more. I think the big things that you you touched on, and one, I just want to point out, like you guys, uh, you're pretty much a 50-50 import-export port, which is so important because you you do, you, you export a ton of agriculture. Obviously, you have the apple growers in eastern Washington, and um, it's, it's a big part of, I think, the federal government, if we actually had a national freight strategy, we'd be talking more and more about how do we promote exports, and you guys do a fantastic job of servicing uh, the export customers. But the, the amount of freight that we lost, and I just want to touch on this quickly, uh, the amount of freight that we lost as a West Coast gateway because of the labor negotiations was really catastrophic if you think about it uh, and i'm going to use southern california because john you know you know i just know southern california like the back of my hand um but you know at one point in time 109 ships waiting uh, which set a record off the coast and uh as as the volumes dipped i mean we started seeing cargo dip in july but we didn't dig out of it until september so i think a lot of people were hopeful that maybe negotiations would get done and ships would start showing up again once the, the queue had diminished and it would get us back on track. But, uh, you know, talk about if that didn't happen because there were no disruptions. Perception, unfortunately, becomes reality. People had bad experiences in 2002 and 2014, 15. And here we are basically holding the bag uh, for freight that was lost during some record, record numbers for the East and Gulf Coast that quite frankly, should have been going to your port and other ports on the West Coast. Just talk about how that impacted these numbers a little bit more uh, without touching on maybe some of the sensitivities, obviously, because, again, we haven't had disruptions, but perception becomes reality. Yeah, it, it, it's been uh, really a, a, a tale. Last year was a tale of two halves of the year. You know, we, we two up, up in the Pacific Northwest were uh, really digging out of the congestion problems um, first quarter of uh, 2022. Things started to loosen up second quarter and, and certainly second half of the year. Uh, we, we we had terminals that were, uh, quite frankly, at 50% utilization and, and even today. So um, it, it's amazing how quickly there was that shift um, away from the West Coast to the Gulf and East Coast, and I, and I understand it. Um, you know, we all um, have to assess situations and mitigate risk. It's unfortunate because I've always been confident that um, that there wasn't going to be a labor strike or a lockout. I think we we learned our lesson uh, years ago with some of the uh, unfortunate situations that hit the West Coast, and and certainly. I stay very close to these conversations. I'm not at the table. The ports um, don't have a seat at the table yet. I, I have intel from those that are sitting at the table. So I I have that visibility to the fact that I, did, I, I had confidence they're gonna figure this out. I still do today. Doesn't mean that they haven't been, that they haven't had to deal with some tough issues. It's just, I, I'm pretty confident that um, they will resolve these issues and there won't be huge disruption. Uh, on the West Coast, but uh, it, it's affected us. It's affected um, the amount of cargo that is, is handled here. And we have today underutilized capacity at our terminals, at really all of our terminals. And we have um, six international terminals within our gateway. And um, and then through the whole supply chain, uh, you know, we don't have the long dwell time at the terminals. The rail uh, is functioning back at a normal level. Uh, the trucking uh, side of things is working very well. I would say the one area that um, I still have a little bit of concern, I was going to touch on it later, is uh, on the warehouse side. We're still seeing um, high utilization of warehouse space. And um, 
part of that's driven by the fact that the new builds have slowed down due to higher interest rates. And so these um, uh, warehouse developers uh, are hesitating a bit to add new capacity, um, primarily due to the higher interest rates, but also due to a little bit of question about softening markets. And um, so if things rebound, um, let's say second half of this year, we're going to need to watch that closely uh, because it takes, you know, 15, 20 months from start to finish to build a brand new warehouse. And um, so that, that's probably the biggest concern that I have right now. Yeah. And just quickly before we move on, I, I think it's fair to say, correct me if I'm wrong, if we would have continued with the what happened the first six months of 2022 in the second six months, you would have broke records. You probably would have hit about 4 million TEUs total, which would yeah. have been tremendous. And I know that's what earlier in the year we had had some discussions that this was going to be, you know, a banner year, 4 million TEUs. And uh, and unfortunately, because of the perceptions, r- roughly 700,000 TEUs that should have gone through your gateway didn't. And that's the point I was just trying to make is we all had lost opportunity from a West Coast perspective. Now, luckily, we operate everywhere. So you know, in many of those cases, we picked up cargo in the other seaports. But, you know, we we still, uh, when you have a, a funnel that's only so big, you, you just move the problem, whereas we have so many assets throughout the United States, using them properly and balancing that flow of cargo creates opportunities for everybody. That was that was the point I was trying to make. Yeah, that's a great point, Wes. And the other thing I would say is, um, and you highlighted it, we have a, a pretty healthy balance between the imports and exports. And there's a correlation there that is really important for our exporters. So when our imports drop, it affects our exports because um, it it has an effect on equipment availability and it has an effect on service offerings where the ocean carriers might uh, have blank sailings in our gateway. That really is disruptive to the flow of export cargo. And that's been disheartening uh, for us because we really value um, our exporters, they're, they're most of them, many of them anyway, are right here in the state of Washington, not all of them, but many of them are. And, um, and, and we really value the exports through our gateway. So that was, that, that was also a, a negative impact of the, the decrease in volume this past year. Okay, uh, moving to the next slide. Um, we, we really touched on <laughs> this issue, but I, I wanted to give you a, a, a snapshot of what the market share looks like. And you can see to, to your point, Weston, um, just focusing in on uh, the Seaport Alliance and LA Long Beach, uh, collectively, we lost share this past year uh, to the Gulf and East Coast. Um, and, it, and what's interesting is um, even the Canadian ports had a slight uh, downtick in market share as well. So we, we watch this closely because um, these trends aren't uh, favorable to us. And um, all the more reason why we we need to uh, think of new and innovative ways to approach the marketplace, and and I'll I'll touch on a few of those here uh, momentarily. Next slide, please. So, uh, real quick on the market conditions. Um, again, we've touched on some of this, but uh, uh, we're seeing uh, a declining U.S. import demand. Um, it, 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 certainly, first quarter this year. I expect that we'll. Uh, rebound second half of the year. Um, I think second quarter is still going to be uh, soft, although um, slightly better than first quarter. Um, you know, higher interest rates continue to uh, affect the uh, consumer market, and um, I, I um, happen to sit on the uh, Seattle uh, board of the uh, Federal Reserve Bank, so I have some insight there as to how the Fed's looking at things, and we read about that as well. So. It, it, it's. Uh, I know um, the federal government is concerned about inflation, and um, so we'll see where that goes. But uh, I am optimistic uh, that things are going to land on solid footing here the second half of this year. Um, we we are seeing on the ocean side significant reduction in shipping costs, um, which is good for uh, cargo owners, um, and um, it'll be interesting to watch that because uh, the carriers. Uh, have uh, new builds they're introducing into the marketplace starting this year. And it's going to be interesting to see how those carriers uh, respond to uh, the supply demand needs and balancing that so that they can maintain somewhat healthy rates. Um, From my perspective, uh, super high rates like we saw last year or very low rates 
uh, are not sustainable in the market. I think we all benefit from uh, a rates that um, are competitive in the market, yet allow the carriers to continue to invest and add more service offerings. Um, I mentioned on the export side, uh, there, there's still stable demand for our exports. And I, I think with uh, the uh, zero COVID policy being lifted in China, it creates some opportunities and certainly in other emerging markets for our exporters. Um, the biggest challenge for our exporters has been the reduced vessel calls due to the blank sailings. Um, so we're working on that, trying to address that issue. Um, and then uh, talked about the, the warehousing and, and the challenges there right now. Um, and then on a global scale, certainly the ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine is having an effect on raw material prices and energy costs. So uh, we continue to, to watch that closely. Um, the, uh, the manufacturing uh, shifting away from China is something else that we spend a lot of time uh, watching because we are very dependent upon trade with China. I, I think uh, roughly 40% of our trade uh, is with China. So um, we are also working to expand our uh, market visibility to areas Southeast uh, Asia, as well as some of the nearshoring opportunities. So that's an area that we spent a lot of time uh, analyzing and, and, and uh, market outreach. Uh, next slide, please. So this is really a snapshot of the health of our gateway today. Um, uh, needless to say, we do not have any vessels waiting for birth uh, within our gateway. That was not true a year ago, um, yet today uh, we are functioning at a high level operationally, um, uh, resulting in uh, the fluidity of the uh, terminal. So uh, ports, uh, vessel port stays are, are reduced. Um, and the volume uh, is moving through the terminals pretty efficiently, um, both truck and rail. Um, we're uh, working to expand our, our carrier, carrier service offerings. Um, we have uh, some exciting news with um, a new offering that I'll touch on in a minute. And um, we're, we're continuing to explore with the ocean carriers other service offerings to our gateway. Um, uh, the challenges, the West Coast cargo decline is certainly a challenge. We touched on that, um, and hopefully we'll have uh, uh, certainty about a PMA ILW contract uh, here in the next uh, couple of months, and, um, and that's resulted in the surge of cargo on the East and Gulf Coast. Um, uh, one other thing I should mention here, uh, the, the, the wheel that you see, the supply chain wheel, that's a listing of uh, most, if not all, of our key stakeholders in the supply chain. And we meet with those uh, partners on a regular basis to talk about the performance of our gateway and how we can collectively improve the performance to service our customers. Um, and that's served us well, especially during times of heavy congestion. Uh, next slide, please. So a picture of our Tacoma Harbor. Um, again, we have international terminals uh, three major terminals uh, in, in the Tacoma Harbor, and then two domestic container terminals uh, serving Alaska and Hawaii and Tacoma, as well as our non-containerized cargo activities in the Tacoma Harbor. Um, and then the next slide uh, shows the Seattle Harbor. Um, and again, we have three major international container terminals uh, active today in the Seattle Harbor. And, um, and the, the difference between the Seattle Harbor and Tacoma Harbor is that Seattle is primarily focused on international container cargo exclusively, whereas Tacoma has a more diverse mix of cargo, both international, domestic, and non-containerized cargo. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm gonna highlight uh, some of the accomplishments that uh, our team and in partnership with our stakeholders and customers achieved this past year. And I, I think it's important to do this because it's a way in which we move the needle to improve the gateways performance for our customers. Uh, we, we opened phase one of Terminal 5. Terminal 5 had been shut down for a number of years um, and was not a functioning terminal. And we were able to uh, redevelop that terminal. We spent upwards of $400 million dollars uh, to refurbish uh, the terminal. We're still in the process of bringing phase two of that terminal on board. 
yet phase one opened the beginning of last year and is very active terminal right now handling international container cargo. We also um, the, the, uh, uh, attracted the Globus Auto business uh, to uh, Tacoma. We had uh, we were handling the uh, Hyundai Autos and we uh, we were or the Kia Autos and we were able to attract the Hyundai Autos to Tacoma from another port. That's going to increase our auto throughput by over a hundred thousand units this year. Um, on the back on the container side, uh, we we have a very uh, strong partnership with both the BNSF and UP railroads. Uh, the UP railroad years ago stood up a domestic rail facility in Tacoma Harbor, and the BN uh, replicated that with their service in Tacoma. And what's important about that service is so much of the cargo now is um, port to port where then it moves to a transload facility right in and around our terminals. And then it's transloaded into 53 foot domestic containers and then moved inland to those uh, markets we serve by the BN or UP. And that service offering is right in the uh, tide flats in Tacoma. So they, uh, the efficiency of movement of that cargo from an ISO container to a domestic container to that railhead is very efficient. And uh, we had, uh, as I mentioned earlier, record setting non-containerized brake bulk cargo volumes. And again, we operate that terminal. Uh, we had a strategy like many ports to look at expanding our inland rail hubs. And we were able to attract uh, in partnership with some others, including the railroads, uh, new rail hubs in uh, Pocatello, Idaho, and uh, one in Millersburg, uh, Oregon. And we also have one in Minot, North Dakota. And we're working on another uh, inland rail hub in, uh, in the Tri-City over in Eastern Washington location. And the, the benefit of those hubs is that it allows us to attract more exports through our gateway as well as shuttle our imports to those facilities and um, relieve our uh, terminals of the otherwise congestion that might happen by having those uh, uh, international inbound containers sitting at the terminal too long. It's been a great strategy and we continue to look for opportunities, strategic opportunities to expand our inland rail hubs. Um, we're one of the uh, strategic ports for the US military. Um, and uh, we're one of the top three gateways of choice for the military for uh, handling of uh, uh, military cargo. Uh, we also attracted uh, Raymont, uh, a major Translow warehouse distribution company to our gateway. And we're always looking for new partners to um, provide those services to our value customers. Uh, this next one is really important. Uh, we, we um, worked with Swire and UWL to attract a, a brand new service to our gateway. Um, and this service is a direct service to and from Vietnam and Seattle. And um, so it is a very efficient service. It's a single port of call right here in Seattle. And for those of you that are looking at Vietnam as a strategic location um, for movement of goods, for both import export, um, I ask that you you take a look at this service because um, it's a growing service and um, one that we're really proud of. And that partnership with Swire UWL is is really strong. So happy and, to have that service here. And John, they just won an award for uh, most on time service as 100 percent on time, which is unheard of uh, in the shipping industry. As you said, blank sailings, there's a lot of ways that things can get disrupted. And yet. This UWL Swire service has been 100% on time uh, from Vietnam to to the PNW. Yeah, um, it, it they they have done a fabulous job. What they their strategy is to look for those niche market opportunities where it may be underserved, and they've really leaned into our gateway. And we're we're really fortunate uh, of that relationship because um, they they see our gateway as a significant gateway, yet not as uh, large as some of the other gateways and less congested and that ease of doing business. And that partnership is really strong. And I'm optimistic that as we move forward, um, this uh, Swire UWL partnership is going to expand its service offerings to other emerging markets in Southeast Asia. So we'll, we'll, we'll uh, look forward to that. Uh, we we um, 
I'll touch later on some of the environmental programs, but um, we we have um, we were able to partner with a, a company on our domestic rail business to attract some electric trucks to handle the the uh, movement of the uh, domestic containers. So that was a win for us and uh, here in the local area. And of course, all ports are looking for uh, help from the state and federal governments, and we were able to uh, attract a significant amount of money to our gateway from the, the, our state of Washington and the federal government. Uh, next slide, please. John, just quickly, I mean, those are all obviously huge wins. I mean, that's quite the accomplishment list for 2022. And one of the things I wanted to ask you, because I saw the grants at the end, you know, there's been this focus on infrastructure not being just physical, but also digital infrastructure. And I know even back to when Dustin Stoker was working at the Northwest Seaport Alliance, um, we we had conversations when I was at HTA about you know, how to continue that path forward for digital digitalization of the supply chain and how do we help the terminal operators operate smarter and the truckers operate better with the terminal operators and so on and so forth. And can, can you maybe just give a, and if you're covering this later, I apologize, but can you just give a little bit of, a, you know, a teaser as to like from the digital aspect, how you guys are looking at infrastructure as well? Because, um, you know, as, as we like to say, we like to, we like to take the uh, the brick and mortar assets and make them operate smarter just by layering in data and technology. And, I, and I'm sure you guys are looking at a lot of the same things. Yeah, uh, certainly uh, that's an area of focus for us, Wesson, and, and for other ports. That's an area where we really, uh, to your point earlier about looking for um, other port partners, uh, we're really leaning into that um, at a national scale. So um, I, I will describe it this way. Um, we are not waiting for um, the, the national strategy to be implemented because we'll probably wait too long. So at a local level first, we have our port portal like most ports and um, we are um, constantly enhancing the value of that port portal for our customers. So what we do is we reach out to our customers usually through that stakeholder group and say, here's where we are with our port portal. If, if you could have one addition to this port portal in the next six months to a year, what would it be? And then we we seek that feedback and then we say, okay, we're going to focus on that because that's the next value add. And um, so we're building on that port portal um, annually. Separately, in an addition and in parallel, we're working at the federal level. And um, a, a big shout out to our friends at Long Beach. Uh, you know, they, they took some initiative to uh, uh, come up with this uh, concept of the, um, the the highway system. Information uh, highway. Yeah, thank you. Information highway. And and they reached out to us and said, hey, here's our approach. What do you think? And we we dug in and said, you know, we we like it. Um, and and uh, we said we would be happy to be a, a a partner with you and many other ports that have since uh, signed up to be partners. And so. Uh, we're working very closely with um, those ports that have committed to exploring that, as well as, um, you know, the, the FMC who has taken interest in this initiative and the federal government in general. So um, that that's that's a long term view in my mind. I, I think uh, we can achieve great things there. Yet I don't think that's going to be a one year win. I think that's a a, a five year strategy. And so, again, back to. The fact that we're not waiting for that high information highway to be fully developed. And what we'll do is we'll take the information wherever we are when that information highway is available to us. And we'll take the information that we have within our gateway and plug it into that highway. So um, by five years from now, I hope we have far more information that we're sharing and pushing to our customer base so that it, it makes it easier for them to do business in our gateway as we wait for that information highway. Yeah, and kudos to you. You have, uh, in my opinion, one of the easiest to navigate and consume uh, on your website information portals. Uh, you know, we use it operationally all the time here, and uh, and it's always it's up to date. It lets you know the vessel schedules. It lets you know all the pertinent information to be able to, from the trucking side, service our customers and give them the information. Um, so we we really uh, appreciate what you've done there. I know that you guys have done tremendous work with Advent Emodal uh, on on discussions around. Uh, you know, common appointment systems and standardizing appointments and, and other aspects of a, a larger 
gateway portal. And obviously, you know, that's, I think the buzzword right now, the HTA, uh, I sent a letter seven years ago, they just sent another letter uh, uh, last week saying to Southern California, they want a common appointment system. So it's something we're seeing more and more. And I know you guys have been um, kind of ahead of it just because of the mix of terminals and, and, and the proprietors that they're using. Um, and then also, you know, I would just say we we had Noel on uh, not that long ago talking about what's going on at the Port of Long Beach and Information Highway, obviously, is top of mind with with Noel. And, you know, the more participants we can get in those types of initiatives, whether it's that or something else. I mean, we operate in an ecosystem from end to end. What happens in any area of the country can impact you like a butterfly effect. And so just having that visibility of those who aren't aware information highways is the data lake it's a place where everybody be able to share data and get access to it and pull it out um it's a huge opportunity for the industry and to your point whether it whether it succeeds in five months five years it, it's something that's going to help transform the industry but you got to do it right and it takes some time and and appreciate the steps you guys are taking again uh you guys do a fantastic job of making information accessible to the customers and the vendors of the customers well, thank you for that. And, you know, we've been fortunate that um, all of our terminal operators today, international container terminal operators, use the same system. So it made it was made easier. And uh, you mentioned Dustin, um, you know, he's he's working as a value partner with us now as running one of the terminals here in our gateway. Yet he was instrumental in helping lead that initiative. So uh, he deserves a lot of credit. Okay, uh, moving to the next slide, uh, I, I'm going to quickly uh, highlight our key initiatives for the new year. And um, what what I really would emphasize is the fact that within our gateway, we have the ability to add new additional cargo capacity. And that is unique right now, certainly on the West Coast. Um, and the way, best way I can illustrate that is that Today, you, you, you saw our numbers, you know, we're, we're hovering right uh, around um, three and a half to four million TEUs, depending on the year. Uh, we believe in the next five years with this plan uh, and the execution of it, we'll be able to handle six to seven million TEUs. So that's a significant amount of growth opportunity within our gateway. And it's made available to us by the fact that we still have undeveloped land and in industrial lands in, in our Seattle and Tacoma Harbor that uh, we anticipate turning on, developing and then turning on to the marketplace. Now we'll, we'll measure that against the demand. So we always wanna have some headroom uh, uh, so we never get caught flat footed and, and find that we've got uh, demand, but not a, um, enough uh, terminal space. And that's a that's a difficult balance for ports because these are uh, really heavy capital intensive investments, and you don't get rewarded for over investing. Uh, probably none of us do. Yet um, we have to take some risk, calculated risk, and make sure that we're developing ahead of the demand because these terminals take a uh, number of years to get permitted and and constructed and and really ready for the marketplace. So. Um, that's really our focus um, amongst a few other things. So we're we're working on uh, completing phase two at Terminal 5 in Seattle, I mentioned, um, and that will add a second berth and another 60 acres. It'll ultimately, by year end this year, be a two berth, 185 acre international container terminal. Today, it's, it's one berth and 65 acres. So significant new uh, capacity by the end of this year. And it's got a beautiful on dock intermodal rail yard for, for those that uh, need that service. And it's served uh, uh, very well by the BNSF. Uh, so that that is uh, a number one uh, initiative for us. We're also, we have this exciting opportunity and the picture at the top of the screen illustrates it in the Seattle Harbor. Terminal 46 has uh, been historically been a, a functioning international container terminal. It's a, it's a smaller terminal, it's about 85 acres. It is two berth facility and it's deep water. We're uh, planning to uh, turn that terminal back on with a, a initially one berth and 65 acres by mid-year this year. And we have a partner in PCMC that is uh, uh, interested in operating on our behalf and they're out talking to the market about new service offerings to that terminal. Ultimately, we have a policy decision to make about 
whether to take that second birth and the balance of that terminal, the 85 acres, and turn that back on in the next couple of years. Um, so again, additional capacity this year with the op option to add more capacity in the coming years at that terminal. Uh, in Tacoma, uh, we have uh, a smaller terminal, seven, which used to be an active uh, vessel operation. It's on the other side of the Husky terminal. And uh, we're planning to turn that back on uh, mid-year this year as well. That's a smaller terminal. It's about 30, 40 acres, yet it's another berth with uh, capability to handle mid-sized vessels. So again, new capacity uh, to turn back on within our gateway. Uh, then looking out in the three-year time frame, we're working closely with our partners at Husky Terminal to expand their facility. And, um, and this is a great project for, for us and our customers because it's going to add uh, about uh, a half a million TEUs to that terminal uh, in terms of total capacity in the next three years. And um, it's a complicated uh, project because it requires the Port Authority to acquire some lands and then um, redevelop those lands. So that's why it's going to take probably three years. But uh, again, uh, part of our five-year plan to add significant expansion, terminal expansion to our gateway. Um, we continue to focus on uh, the diversification of our, our uh, mix of cargo. So um, I won't dwell on that, but um, that is part of the value of our gateway is uh, the different types of cargo we handle. Um, I mentioned the, the new service offering with uh, that Vietnam service. We also have some good news. Uh, CMA CGM has just announced they're gonna reinstate a service that they discontinued last year back to Seattle. So uh, looking forward to that service coming back to our gateway. And we're talking to all the carriers about uh, new service offerings. Um, so, um, and, and I will say that they, the ocean carriers are being very responsive to the um, expansion opportunities that we have in this gateway, because uh, as we listen to them, um, nowhere else on the West Coast, including Canada, is there the opportunity to uh, add this type of terminal capacity in the next five years. So I think we're in a unique position for growth. We, we can't assume it's just going to be there. We've got to do our part, but we're, we're really uh, leaning into these opportunities. Uh, and um, then we have some environmental goals. Certainly, um, like most ports, uh, we're working with our partners to uh, look to uh, uh, ultimately a zero emission uh, uh, gateway that that is out uh, decades, in my opinion, um, and we're taking a measured approach. Um, I know that there are political pressures, yet the good news for our gateway is we are not mandated by the state to uh, move to zero emissions. It's a voluntary program, and we intend to keep it that way. And the reason for that is we're blessed to have uh, cleaner air here in uh, Washington State, probably partly due to the inclement weather patterns that we have, yet um, it, we're, we're in attainment. We are not out of uh, uh, the regulatory requirements. We're meeting those requirements. So as long as we stay in attainment, we can remain in that voluntary program. And that's the best approach because we know that our key stakeholders and customers want to move to zero emissions, yet it's gotta be affordable, number one. And um, the, the alternatives have to be available and in the marketplace. And so we're taking uh, that measured approach and making uh, steps to move in that direction. Um, I also just, I highlighted the inland rail yards. You can see those uh, uh, illustrated here. And um, like I said, we're looking for uh, more unique opportunities to establish those inland uh, port facilities. Moving uh, to the next slide. I touched on much of this, so I won't dwell too much more on our sustainability initiatives. We do have a, a clean air strategy that's a partnership between Tacoma, Seattle Ports, and Vancouver, BC. Um, we also established um, a partnership with Busan Port Authority in Korea to explore a green corridor. You've probably heard about this with other ports. And um, so we are in the exploratory stages of that green corridor between our gateway in Busan. And we are talking to other uh, potential partners about the uh, green corridors as well. 
Uh, we've got a clean truck collaborative. It's, it is a collaborative of many different stakeholders, including the trucking community. And, um, and we really follow the guidance of our, our truck trucking community because they know their business better than we do. And they've given us great advice about how to move from the heavy diesel to cleaner engines to ultimately zero emissions. Um, and so it's a, a, a more measured approach, I'd say, than maybe uh, what California has been forced to look at. Um, shore power is important to us. So we're investing in that at our terminals so vessels can plug in when they're at birth. And um, water quality is an important aspect of the Pacific Northwest. So we have an extensive stormwater infrastructure that we invest in that our customers benefit from. Next slide. Uh, on the federal state side, uh, we've got our priorities listed here. Um, many of them are infrastructure projects outside the fence, road projects, primarily highway projects, because if we're gonna take our gateway from three to 4 million TEUs to six to 7 million TEUs, we can't just add terminal capacity. We've gotta add uh, road highway capacity as well, well as rail capacity. So we're working with uh, the state government on those highway projects, road interchange projects that get uh, uh, ease of movement of trucks to and from our terminals to the warehouse distribution network within our gateway. And then at the federal level, one of the key initiatives we've been working on for some time is uh, uh, some reform to the harbor maintenance tax. And basically for us, we, we are blessed to have natural deep water, so we don't have maintenance dredge needs here. Um, and I should mention that uh, we have a deepening project uh, in both harbors. We're going to take our waterways from what is a natural uh, deep water state today of 51 feet down to 57 feet in both harbors. Um, once we, we uh, take it down to 57 feet, we have very little to no maintenance of that um, water depth. So we're fortunate there. Through some negotiations with uh, the federal government and other ports, um, we the, the importers that use our gateway do contribute to the harbor maintenance tax. And we wanted to make sure those importers that use our gateway benefit from that through our gateway. So we were able to draw upon that fund and have some of those funds come back to our gateway for other in-water uses. And so we're really fortunate that that program is in place now and thankful that in the partnership that we have with many other ports, some of which were dredge ports that uh, understood our challenges and, and were willing to find some compromise there. So um, I think that wraps up uh, my portion of the presentation. And if there's time, I'm happy to take some questions. And again, Weston, thank you for uh, allowing me to share a, a little bit about our gateway and what's happening here. No, John, thank you for joining us again. Really appreciate it. This is fantastic. And you know, one of the the tasks I have here at Cargomatic is now our Cargomatic University and, and coming up with curriculum. And I can tell you right now, this is going to be part of mandatory reading materials because I think this is such a great overview of what we do as an industry, how we do it. And you, you really walking through the port and well, the role a port plays and really what is the ports of Seattle and Tacoma in this industry uh, was, was phenomenal. Um, and I know we do have a, a couple questions and so we'll try to get through them. I think the, the first one that we got, um, and very interesting question was, you know, as external stakeholders, this came from a trucking company, what can we do to help the port more? So I think what they're trying to ask is how do we make the life of the port easier? And, you know, I think you can answer that in a couple different ways, but I think just take it from as a broader external stakeholder, the people that rely on the ports, what can they do to help, help you help them? Wow. I appreciate that question. Um, you know, one of the areas that we struggle with in our gateway is hours of operation. And um, especially during the times of heavy congestion last year, um, we were really challenging our terminal operators to um, expand their hours of, of operation at the gate and yard so the trucking community could get in and pull those long dwell containers out of the terminals. What we found was when we did that, um, the terminal operators open their uh, hours of op operation. The trucking community, um, for the most part, didn't show up. And I, I believe it was because, one, we didn't give them proper notice um, so that they could plan ahead and, and staff accordingly. Uh, combined with, 
I'm sure they were stretched thin with the uh, utilization of the trucks that they had. So uh, an area where I think the trucking community can help us is um, find productive ways where we can improve uh, the utilization of the hours that we are open so that we can expand those hours of operation over time. Today, you know, we're, we're functioning pretty well, although it's been frustrating that some of the terminals have reduced their hours of operation to reduce their costs because the volumes are down. So we've got to get our volumes back up. We've talked about how to do that. Yet beyond that, then, I, I think the real opportunity for us with the trucking community is to come alongside each other and with the terminal operators and, uh, operators and say, how do we productively uh, expand the hours of operation. And labor plays a part in that too, because labor costs are expensive. And I've pushed on the uh, PMA at the table to see if they can explore ways in which during the different work shifts that are defined in the contract, that there's more flexibility there. Uh, as an example, uh, you know, right now, uh, if you want to work a hoot shift, you buy uh, a 3 a.m. to 8 a.m. Uh, time frame. Well, the trucking community that I've heard from has said, John, um, really, we're not going to be able to show up till 5.36 a.m. So you have two hours of zero production while you're paying a labor force. So what if we were able to, instead of opening on a flex at 7, open at 6 a.m.? I think the trucking community would respond to that. And I think the terminal operators would be more apt to start at 6 a.m. But we've got to get that kind of flexibility as well. So it takes... It takes many different parties to be agreeable, but that's what I would say is the, the opportunity. I would say two things to that, because when for years worked on extended gates through through multiple ports. And the one thing is it takes time because, again, it's an ecosystem. So the terminal can turn it on tomorrow with the partnership of the ILWU, but then the truckers have to get the, 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 the trucking companies need to get drivers that are willing to work at night. They need to reset their hours of service. They need the consistency in the gates. The warehouses need to be open, so on and so forth. And it takes a couple months typically uh, to get up and running. Um, I know that was the case at, at OICT in Oakland. It took a couple months to be able to really get into a, a groove. Um, so, you know, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more that there needs to be a, a more let's just say concerted effort to make sure all parties are bought in. And, and, and that includes the cut in customer, which is the, the BCO shipper. Right. And then, you know, hours of operations. I, I don't, I don't even want to really touch that, but when we get into the conversation in Southern California about, you know, 24 seven, right. During yeah. the, during the height of the pandemic, they said, but is it really 24 seven? Cause you'd need to have to have, you'd, you'd have to have two 12 hour shifts or, or three, eight hour shifts. You can't have two eight hour shifts and a five hour shift because right. from, a, again, from a trucker's perspective, they're going to shut down when the gate shuts down and then they'll, then they'll reset their hours. So if you don't have a fluid gate that's open 24 seven, or to your point, having aligning the hours, even uh, when you have things like peak season or congestion that come in to get it at, you know, 5 a.m. as opposed to 3 a.m., you're you're in a difficult position. So appreciate your candor on that answer. We'll 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 do this. We're at the end, and I want to give you the last opportunity, John. We've been such a group. Of, I really appreciate, and I think we all do, the presentation you put together. Um, but you know, maybe give us your closing thoughts. And and one of the things that I ask you to weave in is, you know, 2023 will be successful if. 2023 will be successful, and uh, I'll say when we, um, one, uh, in partnership with uh, the ILWU and, and PMA, resolve uh, and and set to 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 bed the, any concern around a West Coast labor contract, and um, for us here in the Pacific Northwest, that we. Uh, earn back the trust uh, that I think we've lost um, with our customers. Uh, that cargo's earned every day. And uh, we've got to do a better job going forward of both earning and maintaining that trust with our customers. Uh, so I'd say those two, uh, when we do those two things, uh, accomplish those two things, uh, it'll be a successful year. We're there to help on the confidence side, on the trucking perspective. You've got my word on that. You've got our collective word on that. 
I want to thank you for joining us. Would love to do this again in the future and, and continue to talk about the updates and maybe do a, a mid-year check-in with you, John, if that's okay. Um, but thank you for joining everybody. John Wolf, CEO of the Northwest Seaport Alliance, has been a great friend of the industry and a tremendous guest today. Appreciate you joining us. Thanks again. Appreciate it. Take care. All right. Bye now.